you take a patient with Crohn's disease and you replace their bacteria with normal fecal, you know, it's called an FMT, fecal microbiome transplant, a number of those patients will do very well. Let's just um, take a look at that Robert actually if you don't mind. Is this the slide here? Yeah, this one. Well here we are. Yeah. This is this is not my slide, my style it. Uh, but you can see, this is what FMT is about. It, it, it's been popularised. It was really developed by Tom Barodi, uh, yeah. who uh, I had the pleasure of having as a PhD student. Uh, yeah. Tom is who, one who of, I met last April, great guy. Well, that's right. He's the guy who discovered the, the treatment for peptic ulcer, but yeah. wasn't on the Nobel Prize list. Um, Tom's, Tom's a very, very, very smart guy. Yes. And he developed this uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and now has taken it to another level. And uh, what it is, it's, it's screening normal healthy people and taking their feces and concentrating the bugs from that and then infusing it through uh, a colonoscope, which is a tube that you put up through the bottom and uh, goes up into the colon. And you can see, uh, and, <clears throat> and everyone laughed at Tom when he started doing this, uh, but he plugged away, literally plugged away, I suppose, one way of calling it. And, uh, and, and, and then a group in uh, Holland said, well, let, we'll do a randomised controlled trial in a particular disease that was doing so well with FMT called C. difficile. Uh, we started, well, he started uh, treating these patients before it was even called C. difficile. And the Dutch, uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, must be a very good journal, and the New England Journal published this paper and the paper, the study wasn't finished because the, the outcome was so dramatic in the active compared with the placebo. They stopped the study and started treating all the placebos with the uh, fecal microbiome transplant. And there was a 95% cure. Now, this is a condition that in America today, there's something like, I think it's 10,000 cases a year with three, uh, three, Oh, wait a second, it's more than that. There are 3,000 deaths a year from this condition. And you can get a 5% cure. And around the world now, everyone's talking about it, and they're all trying to you know, develop systems to treat. But there's a lot of... This is just the beginning. Um, it, it's going to really go into uh, a much more sophisticated form. Now, they're doing with FMTs, with the microbiome, what we're doing with the immune system. So what I'm saying is we need to bring these, think of it as a simple uh, uh, signal system, and let's treat with both uh, making the immune system work better and putting in better bacteria. Uh, and that's what we want to do in Crohn's disease, because we know that if you change the microbiome and get away from, the, uh, from a bad microbiome to a good microbiome, many of these people will do very well. And there are now three randomised controlled trials in ulcerative colitis showing significant benefit. So uh, we're, we're just at the beginning of, of this type of treatment. But there's no sophisticating, clever clogs drugs here, Robert, is there? <laughs> That's the problem. Isn't this a bit of a concern? Shouldn't we be being, trying to be really clever and being and sophisticated farmers well, and well, just a bit of clever things for us? Well, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. The big pharma companies will, will do that because that's where they make their money. They won't be better treatments. Well, they might at least hope they are. But um, they'll be much more sophisticated. They'll be cloned, cloned antigens. They'll be um, specific. They'll, they'll work out what, what, what antigens are, uh, are going to work best. They'll, uh, yeah, you know, delivery systems will improve. All the usual things. You know, I, I could do, I could do this in in, in, in any, any any hospital ward. I could take some poop, dilute it with some water or saline or whatever the recipe is, and just run it in like a mini enema. It's, it's a very simple thing. That's no exactly drugs right. involved whatsoever. That's exactly. Oh, we, we usually clear out the. Uh, uh, we, we wash the. We well, just wash the column out. We get rid of all the bugs that are there and put the new ones in. It's as simple as that. Yeah, that's what yeah. we're doing here. And, and you and I have both seen patients' lives treated by Professor Tom Brody transformed by this. Yeah, that's right. You came along at one of our clinics. I, 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 I met them and I was just... There was a patient who was going to get a total colectomy in England, taking out the whole colon. That's right. Basically, Tom Brody basically cured him by cleaning out his colon and putting in a few new bacteria. It was... It was startling. Well, look, look, my my introduction to uh, uh, this particular um, uh, bug 
was when I, I was working as a, a junior professor at McMaster University in Canada, <coughs> and all the interns went on strike. Jeez, that was a long time ago, and uh, uh, so all, we all had to double up, and I had to become a, I had to go and help the surgeons uh, operate, and we had to do an emergency colectomy on a patient with exactly this this same uh, C. difficile infection. And other causes of, of, of things like, you know, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, it's just, uh, the, the, the effects are just quite yeah. incredible. Well, one thing that came to my mind there, Robert, um, very often, I remember, as soon as patients used to get viral infections, the doctors would come along and say, ooh, 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 you might get secondary bacterial infection, and they write them up for MagniPen, or whatever the broad spectrum antibiotic was at, at that time. Um, I'm assuming antibiotic therapy is going to disrupt the gut microbiome and potentially have significant adverse effects on our ability to generate uh, innate mucosal immunity. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I mean, this is one of the problems that um, you have with the uh, fecal microbiome transplants that you, um, uh, you don't want to be using antibiotics at the time because you don't want to destroy the good bacteria that you've just put in. Um, and I had a patient a couple of weeks ago, which was a huge dilemma because um, it was one of the rare ones that was working slowly and um, we didn't want to slow that down. But um, everyone said, well, you know, maybe there's still some C. difficile, we'll give them some oral vancomycin, which is the antibiotic which is traditionally used, but not nearly as effective as FMT. So we had to tread very carefully as to, we didn't want to destroy um, the what the patient had probably paid a fair amount of money for and gone through quite a procedure. It's not a difficult procedure, really. No, not at all. And then sometimes I think Tom also dries it out and uses it in capsules, doesn't it? So you get That's spores right. from now. Uh, spores spores from that bacteria. Yeah, uh, yeah. Go it, get it through. Can swallow it. And that, I keep telling him it makes most sense because those capsules will also, those bugs will stimulate the post patches on the way through. So you're actually they're actually combining, doing exactly what we were talking about before, combining, stimulating the, immu the, the immunity and replacing the uh, bad bacteria at the same time. And if they're enteric coated, that means that coating can take it through the acidity of the stomach to the alkalinity exactly. of the small bowel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and just be released at that, at, that, uh, at that particular point. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I, think, I think Tom's... I'm not sure it's going to be like about a dozen or 20 uh, fecal donors. They're very carefully screened. Oh, uh, very obvious. They're obviously, you know, checked for all the, all, yeah. all the basic, um, you know, potential well, infectious diseases. We're, 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 and it's a very safe treatment. Tom's been approached by blood banks saying, well, maybe we should start establishing fecal banks, you know, where, where you use that incredible astringent uh, um, assessment of, of donors and specimens. You know, just as you would with blood, uh, you do with the fecal specimens. Uh, but we certainly test for all the resistant bacteria that you don't want to get, um, and all the nasty things that you can possibly get are all tested in every donor regularly. Yeah. And part of the reason that some people are particularly healthy, you know, they've got an optimum weight, they've got good metabolic health, they've got good immune health, it's because of this great microbiome, and uh, all they've got to do is give us some of the feces and they can share that with the world. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. Yeah, yeah I think we're, we're at the edges of all of this. It's, it's very exciting. Um, and we haven't even touched on the metabolic changes, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, a lot of the cerebral issues of change. And, you know, in the animal systems, by changing the FMT of a mother, you can actually influence the neural development of the, of the baby, the baby mouse or rat, depending on what you're looking at. Uh, and of course, genetics are getting their ugly head in all of this. Uh, it's, well, who knows where it's all going to go? I, I'd love to be 22 or 23 now. I'm having to look at what I do for a PhD. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's just going to be so exciting. Yeah, uh, it, it really is quite it's, uh, it's the medical world. And, and, you know, what, what we're doing. Look, uh, I get tired of going to gastroenterological meetings because I, I still see uh, people with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and every second, or no, two out of three, will be yet another monoclonal antibody that the big companies 
making its billions of dollars out of it. And all they're doing, it's just like a sophisticated steroid. You're suppressing an inflammation rather than changing a basic nature of the disease. So we're starting to get tin taxed at what's causing inflammatory bowel disease, systemic inflammation, uh, for chronic fatigue syndromes. All of these things now are getting back to this microbiome, which yeah. so many people now consider as the, the new war. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're giving intravenous morphine, they're giving all sorts of sophisticated painkillers that put local anaesthetics in the finger when all you need to do is pull the splinter out <laughs> to, get, to get rid of the pain. It's just it's just so basic and, and absolute. Yeah, there's no yeah I know, there's no money in pulling splinters out. I know, I'm, I don't think I've ever got paid for one yet. <laughs> We've done several thousand, probably more than that. Um, so we've got, we've got this new idea that's developing. And I like it. It's called, I mean, we've got things like the gut, lung axis, or the gut, brain axis, the, the gut, and, and potentially other mucosas, even potentially genital mucosas, are affecting the, the the health of the overall other, other systems in the body that which we didn't know were were linked in the past but now do appear to be linked through this what we could what we could only call living in a natural ecosystem you know we, we are designed we've evolved for all this time with with these natural ecosystems and the idea that you can somehow ignore that is is is, is arrogant really because i mean in, in my early early studies I mean, bacteria were always seen as the enemy um the bad oh. guys that's right. I mean, if you go right back to the beginnings, uh, back in 1900, when uh, bacteria were first identified, only 20 years earlier, and, and people said, well, look, we've got this gut, we've got good bacteria and bad bacteria. And it was out of that concept that probiotics came. Yeah, and the first probiotic um, was in 1917 by a very smart German doctor called, and I don't know how he pronounced N-I-S-S-L-E, but Nissel. Um, and, and that E. coli that he found was a good bug, this particular E. coli, and he was using it to treat people with inflammatory bowel disease, is still available in the chemist shops today. Uh, I think it's called Mutiflor. And uh, it's still, and, and studies have recently been done to show that it really does have a benefit in inflammatory bowel disease. So, 100 years later, the pharma companies. That's 110 years now. Yeah, uh, the pharma companies don't seem to have read that literature yet. So we'll no, 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 no. It's very cheap. But th th this video, I'm sure, will put all the pharmaceutical industry executives straight onto it because they want to optimise the health of all the I tell you, the funny thing, John, is when they get sick, they're very happy to have it. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, if, you've, if you've got some personal interest in the game, it, uh, the Americans would say some skin in, it, some skin in the game. It, uh, no, it, uh, it, it, the spirit is enlivened. Yeah, you mentioned the, the, the gut lung axis. Oh, I, I don't like to use that term. But I, I used, but now I'm, I'm thinking of uh, this common system. I, I, I'm happy to see the, the gut brain axis because yeah. I think here you're looking at uh, a mucosal uh, system involving immunity and the bugs, but it's influencing the rest of the body. Uh, it's influencing the brain, it's influencing the bloodstream level of inflammation, we know that relates to coronary artery disease, cancer, all of these things now are starting to be looked at in terms of how can they be influenced well or badly by the microbiome. And the database is, is quite impressive. Yeah, yeah no, the concept of a, of a common mucosal system, I agree, that is the, I think that's the optimum concept that we need to work on, the, the mucus immune microbiome protection system. Needs yeah. to be optimised. The proper mucosal system. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> leave out the bugs and leave out the immunity. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I think maybe one of my takeaway messages here, Robert, is the idea that we want to optimise systemic immunity. Of course, we want the vitamin D, we want good nutrition, all of all of those things. But now we need to optimise mucosal immunity as well, and um, you know, have a, a high awareness of both of these systems and the importance of both of these systems. Yeah, I, I think I, I really think that that's going to be a huge thing over the next uh, X years. And and we've started with a single bug that is highly protective uh, in the airways. Um, we can see how that can be extended with more powerful bugs uh, to influence the gut. Um, and I think that what we're going to be doing, I, I can.
nearly promise you, but I probably won't be around when it happens, but that people are going to swap out a bug that they want to stimulate immunity to that will change diabetes, change um, the metabolic syndrome, change fuzzy brains and things, the fatigue syndrome. We know uh, we know all these things are occurring in those other systemic conditions. Uh, and it, it, it's just logical that this will happen. Yeah, yeah, we just need to learn these specific bacterial microbiological interventions. And at the moment, we know nothing about the human virus. I mean, there's viruses in there in the gut as well. We know virtually nothing about that. And we indeed, the, fun, the, the fungi ten, as well. Ten times bigger than the bacterial microbiome. There are ten times as many. Well, mind you, they're much smaller too. Yeah, yeah. But the, the, the obviously, ecosystems, whether they're outside or inside, are there for a reason. It's uh, um, but more learning to come there. And it, this ties in beautifully, in my mind, with, with Professor Dalglish, Angus Dalglish's work, where, where he's actually injecting some uh, attenuated, uh, heat-killed bacteria. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Uh, um, what, what Gus is doing is um, taking... Uh, he, he's worked on this for many years, uh, and he's worked out a particular... Um, it's basically a, a TB look-alike bug, and yeah. a product from that that... It, it works a bit differently. What I'm talking about when we were talking earlier about the T cells being stimulated is highly specific. But uh, what Gus is talking about is non specific. He's stimulating all the T cells, and a number of those will go and be active <coughs> in a cancer substrate. Um, so, um, what we I don't want to complicate things, but whenever we get a specific response, we get a little bit of non-specific response. Yeah. And Gus and I were, were talking about how we can start looking at screening different bugs that can have a just the right amount of specific, the right amount of non-specific, ones that are creating the type of T-cell outcome that we want. Because different diseases uh, are demanding different patterns of immune responses. Yeah. And, and strangely, the regulatory authorities for medicines in my country have refused to license that uh, well, bacterial that's, preparation. That that's really so strange, isn't it? Really strange. Well, particularly yeah, very, when very strange. you just call it messenger RNA and then you don't even have to do preclinical work. Yeah, I, I mean, it's almost as if that, you know, they want to promote sophisticated, expensive treatments as opposed yeah. to treatments that work, but of course... But look, I mean, can I just make something know that? You and I, uh, off air, were, were talking a bit about... Um, messenger RNA and, and the fact we're talking about factories and developing I mean well, I wish I wished I could get some of the funds that's going in <coughs> to messenger RNA factories there's a remarkable woman in Australia who uh, has chronicled all the money and where the money's come from and who's getting it in pretty much all the universities are getting multiple millions of dollars to create factories of messenger RNA something that is not needed for vaccines, uh, they're never going to be better, they'll be maybe sometimes as good, but they bring huge, unsorted out adverse events, uh, and yet it's sexy, it's patented, and you can charge you know, billions of dollars for, for, for and you can create a new vaccine a year, I'm the latest, latest is RSV, um, I hope I'm around long enough to, to have a, a proper assessment of the great value of that. I, I see that Pfizer's uh, flu vaccine failed this week, uh, thank God, because uh, the thought of having messenger RNA vaccines for flu is, is simply frightening, frightening. And yet the, 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 the RSV RNA has been, the, the respiratory syncytial virus vaccine has been approved in the United States and Europe already, so it will be rolled out this. But it's crazy. Well, I wonder if they've ever read the history of vaccination in RSV. Uh, I strongly suspect. I strongly suspect not. Yeah. Professor, as always, um, <laughs> to, 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 I get two emotions with these videos. Well, one is completely fascinating, absolutely amazing. How 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 sophisticated it is, and yet these are these are completely natural, designed. You know evolved systems it's just so beautiful and so simple and the, the other emotion again is just absolute outrage that you know humanity is denied that's these right. 
wonderful treatments that our cleverest doctors have invented for us, but, but the riffraff like, like, like you and me in this case aren't allowed them because the regulators don't approve them. It's just... Well, well that's not a question. The regulators will improve it. Uh, no. uh, it's just that... Uh, well, good, 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 they didn't approve well, it. They didn't approve it. Well, you know, a relatively small amount of money to put it through. We're, we've got the whole thing done. It's... Yeah. it's, it's, um, it's not, well, you know, Knowing the regulators, these well, I've got to be careful. I've got to be nice to them, haven't I? Yeah, we have to be nice. <laughs> because his bacterial preparation that he used, yeah, you know, they, 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 they won't license it. Because if it, if it was licensed, the doctors could prescribe it compassionately. That's right. Can't they? Can't, they can't. Only Gus. Gus is the only person who can use it. Is it? Is it? Um, I, I think it's only in the context of. Uh, you'd have to ask us about that. I think it, I think it's, it's used in the context of trials. Yeah. I mean, it's not made. It's not made available in BNF because it was in BNF. It's, it's, people could just prescribe it compassionately because it, it's got quite impressive database. No, I would have it straight away. You know, why wouldn't you want to reduce your chances of infection, boost your immune system, and reduce your chances of probably most common cancers? Yeah. Well, if you were sat down here, we, we had a, a delightful dinner, and yeah, we were talking about various other things we could use that same sort of product for. Yeah, um, so just cancer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right, let's hope someone's listening. Uh, but uh, for the people that have listened all the way through, well done, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Professor Clancy, as always. Great, great, great to, a, a great pleasure, John. Thank you for having me. Great to talk. Yeah, thank you. Not long ago. Rita Levy Montalcini celebrated her 103rd birthday, and then during the festivities she made a speech, and in that speech she said, my mental capacity is greater today than when I was 20. Normally when I read a story like this, I smile and I say, God bless her, and then I turn the page. But in this case, I took Rita's comments very seriously, and so did the rest of the world. You see, Rita was no ordinary senior citizen. She was a famous doctor who devoted her life to studying the human brain. 